Good evening and welcome to the second webinar of the America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation. My name is Joana gomes Beiram, and I'll be moderating today's discussion on the US approach to regulating artificial intelligence. Before we begin, just a few words about the chair. The America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation is a recent interdisciplinary initiative of the America Europe Fund. And as a convening chair, uh, it aims to bring together expertise at KU Leuven in order to track, examine, and compare regulatory developments relating to technology and innovation in America and in Europe. On top of that, uh, the chair also promotes opportunities for cooperation and learning between policymakers, business communities, civil society actors, and knowledge institutes on both sides of the Atlantic. We had a, a very interesting webinar two weeks ago on the EU approach to regulating artificial intelligence, in which Dr. Aguila discussed the draft Artificial Intelligence Act, as well as the development of an ecosystem of excellence and uh, the EU-US cooperation on artificial intelligence. Today, we are fortunate to have uh, mixed, Mr. Alex Engler with us to discuss uh, regulatory developments on the other side of the Atlantic. In the US, bills such as the Draft Algorithmic Accountability Act have been introduced in Congress with a view to regulating automated systems. And very recently, uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy published a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which is essentially a paper intended to support the development of policies and practices concerning automated systems. Joining us today to discuss these and other regulatory developments is Mr. Alex Angler, who is a fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he studies the implications of artificial intelligence and emerging data technologies. Although he is here today to discuss the US approach, Mr. Engler is also very knowledgeable of EU policy on AI, as he was a Fulbright Schumann Innovation Scholar and is also a fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies. So on behalf of the America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Engler, for joining us today. You have the floor. Sure. Thanks so much. I'm going to take a second to share my screen. How's that working? Can you see the I can. The full screen ask. slides? Great. Yes. Okay. Oh, great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Engler. I'm really excited to be here. Grateful to Kay Leuven and the new chair for um, inviting me, especially so early uh, in, the, in the new chair's work. Um, so I'm going to talk about the state of US AI governance. Um, and uh, I am also more than happy to take some questions and uh, answer the thoughts on the overlap between the EU and the US and the potential distinctions. I've also been working quite a bit on the UAX, so, so happy to talk about um, them both. Um, the My background that's relevant here is twofold. One, it's that I now study AI governance and policy, um, but uh, as we mentioned at Brookings, at SEPS, um, I teach an AI policy class at Georgetown. Um, but also relevant, I spent 10 years as an applied data scientist in um, governments and in policy institutions, and also teaching applied data science or public policy at the University of Chicago and Georgetown. Um, so I have a background in applied data sciences, and I'm also pretty committed to the pipeline of data scientists who want to go work in the public interest, which is going to come up um, a little bit on the capacity side of these issues. Is how do we prepare governments to do this work? Mostly, I'm going to focus today on an overview of how we got to where we are now on domestic AI governance in the U.S., which goes from the Trump administration through the Biden administration and the AI Bill of Rights, addressing some of the major legislation that we see currently proposed, talking about what's missing, um, and also doing a little bit of a comparison between how the U.S. has been supporting the development of AI versus how it is regulating it. And I, I use some European language to say that we're going to talk, you're going to see a trend towards excellence over trust, it, you know, meaning the ecosystem of excellence supporting AI development, funding its research and expansion is getting a lot more attention than regulating it in the US. So let's start in the Trump administration. Um, it is easy to think there wasn't serious work there because of it being the Trump administration, but there was. There was, in fact, quite a bit of serious work. Um, 
under Michael Kratzios, who was the chief technology officer for parts of the Trump administration, um, there was quite a bit of work on AI. In fact, the first takeaway you should have is that there was almost too much work on AI uh, at the cost of more obvious and more effective uh, policy implementations. One really classic example of this is during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Trump administration issued a call to technology, uh, uh, the technology community, places like uh, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, the Zuckerberg Initiative, the Allen Institute for AI, to do advanced AI applications working on COVID uh, research papers. So how do you pull out automated analysis of all the thousands and thousands of papers coming out about COVID? That is sort of an interesting project, but it was also really ridiculous because the US was at this point struggling to properly count how many cases we have. The, Centers for Disease Control was struggling just to do a basic count of how many reported cases. And in fact, the best numbers that we had were at that point coming from um, The Atlantic, a magazine which was doing the best counting of COVID cases in the US for, for over a year. Um, so in some says, senses, the Trump administration was really confused about the value of AI, um, over a few, overly effusive about it at times in ways that uh, were to the detriment of other interventions, like just counting things. Um, but underneath of that sort of top level uh, over effusiveness, there was some actually quite good work um, and work that you need to understand to know how we end up where we are now. Um, so that work comes down to four broad areas, uh, two executive orders, a substantial expansion of the National Science Foundation's funding for AI, and lastly, um, an important act called the National AI Initiative Act, um, which is still some of the really important guiding legislation in the US now. Um, on the executive orders, um, the first, maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence. Uh, this was about guiding principles for how agencies should regulate the private sector use of AI. So this is gonna be the closest relevant thing to what we now call the AI Bill of Rights. Um, this originally was an executive order in early 2019 and then had final guidance in late 2020. And it required agencies to document their regulatory authority over AI systems. That is what existing laws and regulations are important for how AI is being used across all federal agencies. It also had the first set of guiding principles for AI that includes public trust, public participation, risk assessment, fairness and non-discrimination, disclosure and transparency, those 10 principles um, that sort of were the first time the federal government really weighed in on what uh, AI and, and how it should affect civil rights and, and public services. Even though it did that, it was still a relatively anti-regulatory framing. It asked agencies to encourage innovation. It focused mostly on the economic benefits of AI. And even though it mentioned these principles, it didn't really encourage regulation. It didn't really contextualize AI harms. And we won't get that until the AI Bill of Rights. But it was still meaningful. It was a serious document. And it encouraged agencies to create a plan to uh, regulate AI applications. Uh, again, this is very late Trump administration, that final OMB guidance commitments. Uh, around the same time, a different executive order called Trustworthy AI in the federal government required all federal agencies to document their use of public services. Now, in the EU AI Act, this is all kind of bundled up into, into one thing. Um, but here we have a very separate two-pronged approach. One, which is the first executive order on how to regulate private sector use, and the second, a different executive order around how federal agencies are using AI. And this was supposed to lead to a systemic documentation. We sometimes call it an AI registry of AI applications in the federal government um, with survey questions to be designed by the federal CIO council. Um, I will jump ahead here just to say that very little of this actually happened, unfortunately. Um, but these were two serious executive orders um, and, and relatively good ones. The NSF, I'll jump to another slide to show you that there was a dramatic expansion of National Science Foundation funding in AI. There were 15 new AI research institutes created during the Trump administration. Um, most of these are hard sciences, things like AI for molecular discovery, foundations of machine learning research, 
Um, but some are more applied. There's an AI in agriculture lab. There's an AI for adult learning and online education. Um, broadly, it was hundreds of millions of new spending. Um, it's a little hard to tell because there was so much focus on AI spending from the Trump administration that the National Science Foundation actually changed how it counted AI spending. And so in one year, it seemed to say there's about 100 or $150 million worth of AI spending. And then all of a sudden, that number was closer to 500 and then eventually it requested $800 million um, in AI spending, which was actually 10% of its budget in 2021. That reflects in part a reconsideration of what counts as an AI project, whether it's one that is primarily about machine learning and algorithms or one in which uses machine learning algorithms. Uh, the NSF now using kind of that latter definition. So there was a big expansion in funding. It's worth noting, um, probably overstated in the actual numbers you might look at. And then the last thing that happened on the very late Trump administration, very, very end, this passed on January 1st, 2021, so very shortly before um, the Biden administration took over. Uh, and this is the National AI Initiative Act. And essentially a good heuristic is if you see the acronym NAI and then some other letters that probably came from this act. Um, this includes uh, the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative and the, that initiative's office, which is primarily located in the White House at the moment, although it's also a coordinating council. Um, the National AI Initiative uh, Research Research Task Force and the NIAC, the National AI Advisory Council. Um, useful to sort of know all these exist. You know, if you want to see what's going on in these, there's a great website called AI.gov. That's the public home for this work. And so I'll sort of direct you there if this is really relevant to you because this isn't mostly regulatory. I'll mention that the National AI uh, Research Resource Task Force is about coordinating infrastructure for research and policy. I mean, this is almost closer to like Gaia X in the EU context than anything else. You know, it's about building shared computing and data infrastructure um, for AI research and for AI students in scientific fields. Um, and they have an interim report that was out in May, 2022, that talks about building computational power, testing environments, educational tools. Um, so it's, it's, it's an important effort, mostly again about encouraging research. Uh, in the AI space and building on our national labs, which have, have uh, been doing some of this already. Uh, and there's also the NA, uh, National AI Advisory Council. This is housed in the Department of Commerce and is primarily about promoting uh, AI commerce and innovation domestically and, international, and internationally. It's an advisory council to how AI plays a role in, in commerce. Um, so again, important, but you'll notice almost no regulatory role here whatsoever. This is, you see, we'll see some of this work come out of the NI, uh, the National AI in, uh, Initiative Office, but but in in core the core goal here was uh, promoting AI's use, and so this is a pretty big change when we see first of all Alondra Nelson brought in to the White House, and then eventually this op-ed in Wired and public announcement for the White House that there's going to be an AI Bill of Rights. Um, you know, both because the Trump administration was so focused on development of AI and also um, because its executive guidance really had mentioned sort of an explicit hands-off approach and it neglected to create this kind of justification for and contextualization of how AI harms and risks civil rights. Alondra Nelson was a big hire. Um, and I think a, a lot of the reason that we we saw this was because of her. She was formerly a social science professor and um, has a background in, in genomics and the overlap of genetics and racial issues. And so her, her hire as the deputy head of OSTP, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, was, was a big move. And I think part of the reason why we saw this um, and her hiring leads to other people like Sorel Friedler, Suresh Venkata Samaranian, who are AI experts um, with a focus on ethical and responsible use of AI. And so that's how we end up here. There's, it's Alondra Nelson, it's the hires that come from her and others at OSTP. And we get this, this announcement about you know, uh, eight or 10 months into the uh, Biden administration. A year later, fast forward to just the very early of October this year, and we get not quite the AI Bill of Rights, but a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, uh, which is the word blueprint is, is a bit of a reduction in, in scope. Um, I think they realized that the phrase Bill of Rights was uh, 
quite aspirational, maybe an exaggeration of what um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy could do. OSTP is in fact an advisory body. Uh, and this led to some press disappointment. So if you see some critical articles in the, in the press that might be partially a misunderstanding of what this office can do and also a, a bit of an exaggeration from the office on calling something an AI Bill of Rights or Bill of Rights being a very you know loaded and impactful term in, in the US. Okay, but what is the AI Bill of Rights? First and foremost, it is the detailed exposition on the civil rights harms of AI. And this was really missing from the Trump administration. So the Trump administration executive orders did say, okay, here are some potential harms and principles for AI, but the Bill of Rights is a really, really detailed uh, account of, of dozens, if not over a hundred ways in which AI can, can be dangerous and its proliferation in really critical areas can be harmful and that there's an explicit role for government in preventing those. And it talks about hiring and education and healthcare provisioning and financial services access, uh, as well as commercial surveillance and some others. Um, that list is going to look really similar to the high risk annex of the EU AI Act, um, with two exceptions. It is uh, going to be less focused on product safety. In fact, you'll notice I basically won't bring up product safety at all during this talk very infrequently. Is there a clear focus on, on AI and products? A few exceptions. Um, and also there's, I believe, a little bit less on critical infrastructure, which I think is just seen as a different topic in the US. Critical infrastructure and cybersecurity is a different endeavor there uh, that's seen as, as less critical or pri less primarily an AI issue. It has new principles. There are five principles. Um, you know, they're AI principles. We've all heard them before. So maybe just a quick overview. Um, safe and effective, I think, is a response to some growing evidence that uh, there's a lot of AI fraud in the US, a lot of use cases that simply don't work, whether that's student monitoring. Um, so a good example, you know, monitoring of students during, during tests to see if they're cheating. That frankly just doesn't work at all. Um, effective computing, seeing if people seem like they're lying when they're interviewed by law enforcement doesn't work. Um, and sort of glad to see a little bit of pushback from, uh, from the White House here. Um, that's not a guarantee that AI systems are effective. Um, it talks about notice and explanation. Um, essentially, do individuals are aware, are they aware that they're interacting with an AI system? Uh, the third principle is on algorithmic um, discrimination protections, you know, classic concern about uh, uh, disparate impact of algorithms. Uh, data privacy is the fourth, slightly less common, but I think, you know, a lot of the harms in the U.S. from algorithms have come from unrestricted use of and collection of data. Um, and then the fifth is human alternatives uh, consideration and fallback. Um, which is notably different from the EU take on of human in the loop. It's more about, is there a human that you can appeal your decision to, to check if it was an error, to see if you can correct your information to get an alternative path forward. Um, those are perfectly nice principles, um, but I think more important and more likely to last is uh, the blueprints focus and clear endorsement of an agency-led and sectorally specific application of AI regulation. This is an enormous difference. In fact, it's the biggest difference between the EU and US approaches to AI governance. Okay, so what do I mean by this? In the AI Bill of Rights, you see this associated list of federal agency actions. And essentially what this is saying is we are going to leave it to federal agencies to individually decide how AI affects their specific areas and then adopt new rules and guidance in that area. And they point to what's happening so far. Um, they point to FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, which has done the most work, which is doing a new rulemaking on unfair or deceptive practices in commercial surveillance. FTC has also required some algorithmic deletion and some uh, for privacy violations and violations of terms of services. So they've already actually done some enforcement. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission issued new guidance on how AI uh, hiring software should meet existing law in hiring people with disabilities. And I, I think some of us expect to see more from EEOC on, on other areas and how uh, hiring software uh, is used and, and especially with discrimination. 
Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has said that AI credit systems must offer explanations if they deny credit access. This actually already exists again in law for um, uh, for human decisions on credit access, but again, it's an application of existing law to AI systems. Um, I was really encouraged to hear that Health and Human Services is starting a big review of racial bias in health provisioning systems. These are algorithms that decide how much care a person might need in the future and sort of estimates their likelihood of needing care, which can affect how much care they end up getting. Um, and there have been enormous, terrifying uh, degrees of racial uncertainty shown in these. Some from the Department of Education, and then I'll talk more about housing and urban development in a second. But this is a, a real and lasting amount of change. Um, it's, it's significant for a few reasons. It's significant because it's driven by agencies and really specific uh, guidance for sp specific applications. And there are real advantages of this application specific approach. And again, this is why I'm trying to draw a distinction between what you've heard about the EUAI Act, which is really presently about centralized AI guidance that will then be distributed to many different regulators to do the more specific work. But the US is kind of skipping that step. Um, the advantages are that this work has already begun. Um, in some cases, I will mention actually some products briefly, Department of Transportation on Autonomous Cars, AI and Medical Devices, the EEOC, that's the Employment Commission on, on AI Hiring. These things have been um, already begun for years. They don't have to wait for a single piece of past legislation. They can just start applying the laws that they have now on AI, which in some ways is a real benefit because they're going through the incremental process of, of learning. So individual agencies are um, often motivated to do this because they're collaborating with and driven by stakeholders. Um, in fact, I think they're probably more likely to motivate, uh, likely motivated to work on these issues when they're driven by calls from engaged and valued stakeholders. Um, the PAVE Action Plan is, is a good example. This is um, a plan to advance property appraisal and valuation equity. Um, that is in less, less specific language. The models and tools that set how much um, or estimate the property value of a certain uh, piece of land. Um, and a lot of wealth in the US is, is driven by land values. And so inequity in, in property evaluation is a big cause of wealth inequity between black and white, black families and white families, between Latin American families and uh, Latin American families and, and white families. Um, and the pay plan calls for regulation of the automated valuation models, the AI systems that do some of this property valuation. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about that is they didn't just decide to do this on their own. They have been driven by advocacy organizations, places like the National Fair Housing Alliance has, has asked for housing and urban development to work on this issue. And so housing and urban development created a multi-agency group. They, uh, I think as many as like 14 other agencies all came together and they built a really thorough plan to deal with um, these uh, these evaluation, these property evaluation issues. And it's not just algorithmically driven. It's actually both driven by algorithms and human appraisers, right? And so when you get a motivated agency, they're not going to just cherry pick the algorithms because they have to because of some general law. They're going to broadly consider everything that's going on, which is not just the algorithmic systems, but also the individual people and uh, uh, companies and, and non-technical processes that are leading to this disparity in property valuations. Um, and I think that's really important. I think you, you're much more likely to get to good public policy if you don't segment off uh, algorithmic policy problems and non-algorithmic policy problems. Um, so that's a real advantage here. And I expect, frankly, I expect that to lead to much better public policy in the long run. Um, another advantage of this approach is you get distributed AI governance capacity. Um, agencies, individual agencies have to start building capacity to deal with this. They have to hire data scientists or AI experts. They have to learn how to store data and do analyses of that data if they wanna examine what's going on in the field. They have to do surveys of how it's being used, uh, AI is being used within their, within their existing regulatory guidance. And again, a lot of agencies have started doing this, 
uh, and that I think is is valuable. And lastly, um, since you know this is a bit of an EU audience, I, I will mention that it avoids a lot of the real struggles with the EU AI Act, um, which is trying to write you know consistent rules for many, many, many different types of algorithms. The AI Act is basically trying to define AI in a way that meaningfully applies to medical devices and elevators and hiring systems and mortgage approval all at once. And that's difficult, it's, it's nearly impossible. Um, and while I think the AI, AI Act does other things that are really helpful, I'll talk about that in a sec, those types of definitional issues are extraordinarily hard and the US just doesn't have to do it. The federal agencies can define specific problems. They can talk about specific types of algorithms in specific circumstances and build much more um, narrow guidance. And, and that's a real advantage in, in this approach, this sort of sectorally specific approach. Okay, if that's the upside, what's the downside? There are a couple really significant disadvantages of doing this. Um, the first is that there isn't a change in law, and so there isn't a change in authority. So the AI Bill of Rights is encouraging agencies to do this, but if you already didn't have the resources to do it, or if you already don't have the capacity, the, the legal mandate to do it, then you probably can't do anything new. Just a couple examples. Um, a lot of AI hiring comes down to a small number of vendors, that is companies that sell AI hiring software, but our employment agency, the EEOC, cannot target those vendors. It cannot investigate those vendors. It can only investigate employers. And so there's a mismatch between EEOC's legislative authority and how AI is being used in the field. Another example, the Department of Education's educational technology team has two permanent staff. So while they may be interested in this and there's a growing, uh, slow but growing interest in, in how AI is used in education, uh, the Department of Education is fundamentally very, very limited in, in what it can do in terms of capacity. Um, and so, you know, when you sort of are adapting existing agencies to these rules, you're gonna have some, some really big mismatches here. I broadly wonder if many more agencies need core ability to do algorithmic audits, for instance. And I think that's probably pretty common across most agencies, the exclusion of like the FTC. And then the other problem here is because it's piecemeal, because you're doing these individual applications, you leave big gaps in what you can do. So the biggest gap in the AI Bill of Rights, there's nothing on federal law enforcement. In fact, not only is the AI Bill of Rights non-binding in general, it is suggestions and broad documenting of what's happening. It is especially non-binding to law enforcement. And so there's nothing on facial recognition, for instance. Um, while Ed, Department of Education is doing a little bit on uh, AI educational tools, it's doing nothing on educational access or pricing. Um, there's almost nothing on worker management and surveillance issues, very, very little, only, uh, only rules to make it harder to surveil union organizing. Uh, and another example, there's nothing on insurance, um, algorithmic pricing and approval of insurance. So, and, and I'm sure there are others, I'm sure you could find many other people who will say, in my area, my agency has been very slow to adapt to algorithmic challenges. And that's because of this piecemeal approach. So I expect better work in some ways starting sooner, but with some really key missing areas. And in the case of law enforcement, if they don't want to do this, there's nothing in the Air Bill of Rights that will make them, right? They can continue to sort of not set standards for the use of AI tools. Um, you know, and there's 100,000 law enforcement officers in the US and many, many federal law enforcement officers and many, many agencies. So that's, that's a big issue. And the AI Bill of Rights doesn't plug that hole. A few other worthy, noteworthy shortcomings of AI Bill of Rights. Um, you know, I mentioned those two a Trump executive orders. Unfortunately, the AI Bill of Rights, you would really have thought they would have taken the opportunity to, to use those, um, and, and unfortunately, they, they really didn't. Um, on the first, maintaining American leadership in AI, th that is about how agencies can regulate AI. Most agencies didn't respond. In fact, almost all the agencies either didn't respond or submitted useless responses. You know, agencies saying, the Environmental Protection Agency said it had no regulatory authority over AI, which is obviously false. They regulate air quality models. They have been for 50 years. So unfortunately, no one held their feet to the fire to make them do this. 
Uh, and, and it could have been really meaningful. The health and human services did offer a really meaningful response. And that showed how important this could be. It documented relevant statutes, information collections, and, and more. And then uh, a lot of agencies also functionally ignored the AI registry. This is how agencies use uh, AI in, in their agency. They basically ignored that too. Uh, and this was an unfortunately another shortcoming. Um, I talk about this in depth at a Lawfare article. It's called AI Bill of Rights Makes Uneven Progress in Algorithm Protections. If you want to read more, I suggest that. Brookings, we are also hosting, hosting an event with uh, on this topic. I'll be on the panel. We'll be hosting Sorrel Friedler, who is uh, one of the lead, if not the lead, White House author of the AI Bill of Rights. And that's uh, December 5th. So you should keep an eye out for that if you're interested in getting into this in more depth. Um, OK, so this leads us to some quick notes on the potential legislation that we're seeing from the US. Um, I will caveat with this is not very likely to happen. Unfortunately, um, I don't think any of the bills I'm about to talk about are particularly likely to happen. The Algorithmic Accountability Act, um, while it is the most thorough, is not especially likely to happen either, um, as it substantially expands the FTC, which most Republicans think is, um, you know, a, a regulatory authority that oversteps its bounds already. And there's just not a lot of appetite on, for Republicans to pass more regulatory work. So starting with the assumption that this is not likely to happen, and I'll mention the bill that is most likely in a second. So Algorithm Accountability Act, um, it does really two things. It, it's focused through the uh, lens of impact assessments, and it requires a lot of companies to do impact assessments. And then this will inform the FTC, and the FTC will inform other agencies on risks and harms in sort of expanding AI uses. Um, so this is a little tricky, but you know, the essentially the it affects companies that are particularly large. 50 million in gross receipts or 250 million in equity value. That's the realm of companies. Um, if they are using automated decisions as part of a critical decision. And I, uh, in the sake of time, won't jump into how the decision compares with the EU, but I'd be happy to talk about that if people were curious. Um, and then critical decisions, again, this is close to that list we've seen a, a few times. It says education, employment, worker management, essential utilities, financial planning, uh, financial services, family planning, housing, lodging, legal services, et cetera. Um, and, and because this is the enforcement goes through the FTC, that is really about private sector use of AI. The FTC does not have enforcement over governments. Um, and so uh, this would not affect government use for AI for public benefits or something. And then what does it require? It requires impact assessments and a summary report to the FTC. You know, I want to be clear, this is the most serious piece of US legislation on AI. It's the most well thought out one. And it mostly requires companies to think really hard about how their AI systems work and then tell the FTC. It doesn't go nearly as far as the UA Act in setting broad standards on most of these things. It basically is a you need to assess yourself and then report centrally to the federal government in those series of sort of highly impactful cases I mentioned before. Um, and the, you know, the impact assessments are pretty thorough. There's a lot that the companies have to do. And then there's a shorter list that's still pretty significant on reporting to the FTC. So it's a lot of reporting, um, but it's not that much enforcement. Um, and so decision of a description of the decision, how did the company test the, the models for performance and bias, any guardrails, any transparency measures, et cetera. And then the FTC can then share this with other regulatory agencies. Um, if you wanted to be bullish or overly over, you know, positive on how this works, um, the FTC could use this essentially to hold companies to the standards of their current legislative authority. So, so if you uh, are engaging in fraud and your impact assessment does not back up what you're saying publicly, you, the FTC could potentially fine you. Um, and then by passing on other information to agencies, maybe those agencies are better equipped to sue or, or provide oversight of those companies. Um, but it's not really focused on enforcement. It's it's a pretty, a relatively light touch, I think, as most Europeans would, would see it compared to the UA Act. Um, but it would lead to a lot of information. Um, 
uh, annual report on AI trends. I'm sorry, that third bullet should say FTC passes along relevant information to federal agencies, must have deleted that. And it leads to a public repository with some of this information uh, for each automated decision. So it would lead to a lot of public information about how many sort of high risk, high impact AI systems there are. Uh, and then it would get FTC resources for enforcement on some of this, but you know, not a ton, not a ton of rules on standards of how they should work, mostly that they are doing these impact assessments. Um, quick note in the short term, this bill would has the upside of of giving the FTC, which is a relatively competent and agency on on these topics, more capacity and authority, and and we would learn a lot more about how AI has been using in high risk circumstances. Um, in social policy. Uh, on the, uh, there is a downside, which is in the long term, you, we really do want that distributed expertise that the AI Bill of Rights um, emphasizes. And this wouldn't unfortunately quite do that. Now, this is all kind of beside the point because despite the fact that this is a serious piece of legislation that's, that's well reasoned, I think it's not very likely to happen at the moment, not in the few months in this end of this Congress. And if Republicans take control of Congress, it becomes much less likely to happen. So what's slightly more likely to happen is the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which is the US approach to federal privacy legislation, which I will not talk about in detail. I will note that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, has expressed objections to the bill, which would con conflict with and partially override the uh, California, her home state's data privacy law, and that preemption is a problem. So she has expressed um, opposition to it. That being said, it is still the most likely AI bill to pass. Well, it's a data bill, but it has a section on civil rights and algorithms, section 207. Uh, and it does essentially two things. It says, if you're covered by this bill, then algorithmic discrimination is illegal. And um, I don't think it's super explicit on how that'll be enforced, but uh, presumably through the, the next process, which is it requires algorithmic design evaluation, including external and independent auditors and researchers to do that algorithmic design um, evaluation. So this would be like an external auditing for very large data holders um, on some significant algorithmic uh, processes. Um, this is actually more likely to happen, but is unfortunately less thought through. Um, the FTC would be deciding which algorithms count, under what circumstances they would exclude algorithms that are low or minimal risk. Um, there would have to be these assessments done by independent and external researchers, and they'd be submitted to the FTC, uh, which then presumably could decide if there was algorithmic discrimination and, and issue fines, and, and the assessments would also be partially available to Congress. So this, unfortunately, is actually not as well thought out and not as thorough as the other AI legislation we've seen, um, but it's actually much uh, could feasibly happen in this lame duck, though um, you're always better off betting against significant legislation passing in the U.S. Um, I'm happy to take questions on this broader set of other stuff happening. I think I'm more or less at time. So I'll mention that there's a series of other individual pieces of legislation that could happen um, on facial recognition, uh, which is a, a proposed act that, again, probably won't happen, but sets guardrails on law enforcement use of facial recognition. The Platform Transparency and Accountability Act sets uh, implements researcher access to large platforms, much like the Digital Services Act, again, proposed, unlikely to happen anytime soon. And I'll mention just now the New York City AI hiring audit legislation is actually is going to happen. Uh, and New York City is going to set up a process by which AI hiring systems have to be audited independently for uh, discrimination. But the, the how of that is still really being actively uh, debated. Um, so some local efforts here and there. Um, an absolute so sorry for giving that short shrift. I just got a little over. So I'll just give a quick couple takeaways. You know, if you think of in the European framing, our ecosystem of excellence is beating out the ecosystem of trust, right? It's it's um, much more funding. It's uh, funding for semiconductors. It's funding for AI research. It's um, uh, ensuring that data flows to the U.S. are working. We're even undermining China with semiconductor export controls. Um, and that that framing of a competition with China around technology dominance is really, really pervasive. You know, we're working on 
uh, AI standards to ensure that uh, AI trade and products um, still continue. And there's it, so you, if you can think of something that falls into this sort of idea of ecosystem excellence of supporting the use of AI, it's much more likely to be enacted here than something that you would think falls into the sort of ecosystem of trust. The how do we ensure that AI is being safely? Now the AI Bill of Rights, that said, is the ecosystem of trust. That's uh, it's still meaningful. It's a reasoned approach. Um, but it leaves gaps, and in many ways, some agencies just won't be able to implement it without more significant changes in their capacity. And while there are some legislative approaches, we mentioned the Algorithmic Accountability Act, I mentioned briefly the American Data uh, uh, Privacy and Protection Act, um, a more reasoned approach might try to give those agencies the capacity they need and maybe expand their mandates a little to keep that those the value I was talking about, the value of individual agencies working on problems they're motivated by and that their stakeholders want them to work on, that they have expertise, right? Maybe we keep that, but we give those agencies more capacity, right? To spread out some sort of algorithmic auditing um, mandate, some sort of uh, regulatory authority and some sort of funding for, for capacity to sort of expand how agencies can do that. That, that sort of is my preferred approach, but that... Um, hasn't been brought forward in legislation yet, and, and there are some barriers there as well. Um, so happy to stop there to take any questions um, that people might have on, on the state of what's going on in the US. I know we just covered quite a bit, so happy to go back to whatever is of interest. Uh, and I'm also working on the EU AI Act um, quite a bit, including on the value chain issues. Uh, and I will be back, in fact, in Brussels next week to, to work with the European Parliament on some of this. So i um, happy to take any questions that are um, uh, of value to you all. And again, thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you very much for this very interesting and comprehensive uh, presentation. I would like to turn now to our participants to remind them that they can use the Q&A tool to ask uh, questions. I see that there is, we already have one question, but I'd like to, one, to ask one question uh, before we get to that, um, just to take advantage of your cumulative uh, expertise on AI governments in the US and as well as the draft AI Act. Please. So if, if we look at the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, it refers to automated systems. And if we look, for example, at the draft Algorithmic Accountability Act, it refers also to automated decision systems. Whereas the EU draft AI Act refers very explicitly to AI systems and high-risk high AI systems. Yep. And we are seeing that there's a lot of difficulty during negotiations over defining what is AI and what is yep. high risk. So my question is, to you is, would there be a benefit in the EU learning from this approach that's being followed in the US? There, the, the EU has a, a real challenge, which is that they, you know, the, the process that the EU is going through kind of necessitates setting some sort of scope for the AI Act so that the member state regulators know what they're being given specific authority to do, right? What types of AI systems fall within their, their purview and, and what an AI system is. And so it's not clear to me that the EU can adopt the US approach because they are passing the central law. I, they could give maybe more flexibility to the member state regulators to say, how they're going to interpret that, but that's also tricky because it, it's going to a, a series of different member state regulators who all need to agree on what this law means. So, you know, it is actually quite hard for the EU to learn from the US. If anything, it seems like the US learned from the EU that they absolutely don't want to define AI, that they didn't try at all in the AI Bill of Rights. Essentially, what they said is if agencies decide that some sort of automated process is partially or significantly affecting a decision, doesn't have to make the decision on its own. It can be significantly affecting the decision to grant a mortgage or to ena uh, enable educational access, can be partially involved. Well, if that's enough for the agency to think that it requires you know, regulation and oversight, then they should do it. And that lets totally different applications of AI that might include you know, really complicated natural language processing models in one case to say, analyze a cover letter or really simple decision trees or even handset rules in another case to both be included in the broad US government approach because it's down to the application, the sector and the specific companies doing something. And so if anything, the US looked at the EU experience and said, we are not doing that. 
Um, and, and unfortunately, it seems that you may be stuck in this and, and ha will have to make some hard choices around the definition. Um, but the US is mostly going to make those choices within each application and within each sort of, uh, certainly within each sector and often within specific applications, right? So it's, there's a difference between, you know, you can think of AI and financial technology, but there's a difference between the model that, you know, approves you for a mortgage and the model that sets your credit card limit. And we can set different rules for those different systems because they're going to be done by a sectorally specific regulator. And that's, that's a real advantage of the US approach. But again, the problem being some of those applications will take a long time to get to, whereas the EUA Act says, well, you all have to cover this whole swath of applications at the same time. Thank you. And now going to the question from one of our participants. Um, it's, it seems that most agency actions and initiatives in the US are rooted in aligning AI with existing legal and regulatory principles. So our participant asks if there are any actions to strengthen a forward-looking technology assessment that might result in additional principles to govern AI, such as establishing limits on whether AI can be applied or direct AI innovation into socially promising directions. The, the, there are definitely legislative ideas to do that, but the reason that you're seeing the AI Bill of Rights take the tact that it did is because there's, it's the White House isn't particularly convinced it can get AI legislation through. Um, a good way to think about this is that it's hard to pass new regulatory legislation in the U.S. on anything that restricts the role of technology um, because of this sort of because the Republican Party doesn't want to, also because of this broad narrative around competition with China being sort of core to US policymaking. So we want to, you know, broadly people want to encourage technology and aren't that interested in restricting it. And that means the AI Bill of Rights had to work with an existing law and existing regulatory uh, roles of agencies. And that's why it wasn't, doesn't really have super explicit calls for new capacities. It doesn't arm agencies with a whole set of new tools. It doesn't even call or mention new legislation. Um, that's probably realistic. I don't think there's any chance we get AI legislation until we get data privacy legislation and data, which data privacy has been an ongoing debate for, for years and years and years, right? If not decades. And so the idea that we're going to get AI legislation first just isn't very realistic. Almost certain to get that data privacy legislation or something else first. Um, and so I think this is admission by the White House that they need to do what they can with, with the tools that's, that's available. Um, the Facial Recognition Act is an example of what you're talking about. Uh, it sets a whole bunch of really specific rules for um, facial recognition used by law enforcement, um, you know, such as uh, you have to have a warrant to scan someone to match them to a facial recognition database, uh, sets um, uh, only for violent crimes, you have to notify the defendants when you use it. You can't use it for immigration purposes. The photos must be legally obtained. The AI, the facial recognition system, must go through NIST standard, you know, our federal standards. All sorts of guidelines to raise the bar, and that would require new legislation to do that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, currently there is the appetite for that type of restriction uh, in Congress. And, and again, unfortunately, in the U.S., your, your best bet is to bet against it. Um, if we see a Biden administration that, that comes back, I wonder if the tech policy community will start pushing for um, some meaningful restrictions on technology use pushed into other laws, you know, into uh, funding and authorization laws. I, I wonder because the, the idea of getting them through on their own has, has not worked very well. And, and that's the sort of product. The AI Bill of Rights isn't it kind of an admission of that, though it's also a reasonable strategy. Thank you. And I have another question about the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, because it calls for transparency and explainability so that essentially the people affected can understand how the system made the decision. Do you think this is an achievable goal in the new future, and especially considering that this is non-binding, um, a non-binding document, but also considering that some systems are very difficult to explain in plain language or even operate as black boxes. So is this too much to ask, especially in a non-binding document? There are places in which already in law, you have to meet explainability requirements. Um, so I mentioned the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is starting to enforce the idea that 
if you get denied by an AI credit system, you have to be given a simple and understandable explanation. And they're saying, we don't really care what algorithm you use, but you have to explain to people why um, they're being denied credit. Uh, there was also an ongoing review from five financial regulators, um, which includes the Office of the Currency Comptroller and the Federal Reserve and the Federal Deposit Insurance Company and I think I'm missing CFPB and, and COA maybe. Anyway, so five financial regulators coming together to review how AI systems change their approach to AI governance. And in some of the financial tech sector, they're really worried about this. Um, and they're, they're even, it's, even the current law, even without enforcement, has led to a lot of these um, companies to use relatively simpler algorithms. They're still complicated algorithms um, for those who want this detail. They're going to get. They're going to use things like gradient boosted trees, which are complicated decision trees, rather than neural networks. And they're going to do that because the explainability metrics in the gradient boosted trees are are easier to use and more clear, even though they have some real limitations. And those financial technology companies have convinced themselves that that is close enough to meeting the current law. And we'll see if the financial regulators agree. It's not clear that that uh, conversation has really borne out yet. Um, but it, my point being, in some of these cases, existing law is already here. It's already affecting the thinking of the companies, and it may, um, and, and as regulators go to enforce it, it could be sort of uh, quite meaningful. Now, there are other cases where that's not the case. You know, you're not required to get an explanation for why you weren't given a job, right? And so if we wanted to get to some sort of explanation around why you didn't get through an automated resume analysis system, well, currently that doesn't exist, and it would be very hard to enforce that broadly, again, without a, a change in law. So, uh, you know, all sort of sectorally specific answers. In some cases, yeah, you're going to see um, some meaningful enforcement and others, no, absolutely not. But again, again, maybe an advantage of the EUA Act, right, that it's going to say you have to do this in all of these cases. Mm -hmm. And in your presentation, you briefly uh, touched on EU-US cooperation. So I wanted to also ask you about the Trade and Technology Council, since it's the next meeting will be next month. And in the last meeting, um, the EU and the US agreed to develop a joint roadmap on evaluation and measurement tools for trustworthy and AI and risk management. And next meeting, this the first draft will be will be discussed. So, would this be uh, sort of a first step or a next step towards an alignment of the EU and US regulations on artificial intelligence? Really generously, what I think we're going to see happen from the actors involved in the TTC is to try and align broadly the risk-based approaches. So one thing the US really likes about the EUAI Act is even though it's very broad, it does label specific categories of high-risk AI and says, okay, let's take these specific categories and create rules just for worker surveillance, just for hiring, just for financial access, just for public services, rather than rules that affect literally all algorithms. So the U.S. likes that. I think it makes sense, too. Um, and those categories will sometimes align well with the AI Bill of Rights and what the U.S. is already doing around existing high-risk areas. I expect the TTC to try and align some of those areas, look sort of forward towards what the U.S. regulatory agencies will do on one side and what the AI Act standards will uh, what AI uh, standards will arise in the AI Act on those same high-risk areas, and where they are aligned, try to create standards that can sort of communicate or can, or at least aren't in, in open conflict with one another. Um, it's possible that's going to work. Um, in some cases, there are there is meaningful trade, and we do want these AI systems to work across borders. Other cases, it's not necessarily that it, always the case that, you know, we already have different laws for some things like financial services that aren't don't make them necessarily perfectly aligned. Um, whereas it would be really frustrating, I think, for people who build medical devices if you couldn't, if you'd use totally different algorithms in the medical device you sell in the US versus in the EU. Um, so again, depending on exactly what the application is, I expect the TTC to try to evaluate and find some areas where those high-risk categories can be aligned and, and, and sort of uh, foresee where they're most likely to come into conflict and, and build standards that try to avoid that. And again, Thank I should you. mention that NIST is doing a lot of work, the National Institute for Science and Technology Standards um, uh, at uh, the U.S. Um, and the U.S. government side is, is primarily, uh, is sort of leading the role on, on that effort. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if we go back to a comparison of the EU and the US approach, and particularly thinking that the, the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights as the newest initiative is non-binding, it of course cannot address the issue of accountability for decisions taken by automated systems. And as you've mentioned, most legislative initiatives, including the Draft Algorithmic Accountability Act, have a very hard time passing um, in, in Congress. And some have said that this is an urgent gap in US AI governments in the sense that this accountability is lacking. Do you, do you think that there, that is a real concern or is it over-exaggerating concern considering uh, these different uh, initiatives that are also ongoing? Uh, I don't think the AI Bill of Rights is enough. Um, broadly, it's, you know, I think the, a lot of the work in the EU sometimes seems motivated by the excesses in the US. We have huge fields of products where AI systems absolutely don't work. I'll, I'll, again, I'll mention AI hiring, um, companies that have used uh, effective computing or analyzing facial expressions and movements and the tone of your voice to decide whether you're capable of, of doing a job. That's absolutely pseudoscientific garbage. It does not work. Categorically impossible with the current technology um, and yet somewhat uh, running amok. I mentioned the AI analysis that did try and detect cheating. Um, again, uh, students nearly guaranteed to be racist and discriminatory while almost impossible, if not, if not functionally impossible to make work. Um, then you have large scale systems that do kind of work, but have enormous discriminatory effects. The studies from Santel Melanathan on healthcare provisioning and racial discrimination are horrifying and they're absolutely at, at large scale. Um, and so some of this we will see slow and progressive work on, um, but the scope of the problem in the US where we've really bitten on to AI hype um, we're also having a reproducibility crisis in the AI sciences, uh, meaning a lot of our uh, papers that use the machine learning paradigm are, are not replicating and not working very well. Um, and that's also probably because of the, this hype and this funding. Um, you know, I don't think the scale of the regulatory intervention quite matches the scale of, of the problem. Um, that's probably also true in areas like blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and, and the uh, NFTs and in other related digital assets. Um, our pro-innovation side has benefits in that we get new companies very quickly and some of them are successful and some of them are great, um, but also we get quite a shocking amount of in this latest generation of, of fraud and abuse. Um, and it's really unclear that the regulatory capacity is, is there to keep up with that. Um, so you do kind of have this outcome that we get a lot of the new wealthy companies and we also bear a disproportionate amount of the, the civil rights arms. And I think that's more or less what we're seeing now. Thank you, that, that is a very interesting uh, perspective. And um, I see that that is all the time that, that we have uh, for today. So I'd like to Thank you very much, Mr. Alex Engler, for this very interesting uh, discussion, as well as uh, our audience members for taking part in the webinar. If you'd like to know more about the America Europe Fund, our upcoming uh, events, or watch recordings of past events, including this one, you can do so on our website, which is america-europefund.eu. So thank you very much for joining us today, and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure being here.